The Cook triplet was an innovative lens design in the late 19th century. It was needed to solve a problem with lenses for cameras. With this lens configuration, extremely low aberration is possible. In fact, a flat image is possible. You can imagine the flat field is necessary for a camera because the emulsion was flat. We have three lenses in the configuration. The first lens is positive, the second one is negative, and the third is positive. And by alternating between crown, flint, and crown, it's possible to significantly reduce chromatic aberration. Let's follow two rays through the system. I have an object out here. Let's position it far away, say 200 millimeters away. First, a parallel ray comes in. I'm going to call it the marginal ray. It may not be, but oh, just assume that the height of this object is commensurate with the clear semi-diameter of the first lens. This parallel ray comes in, it strikes the first lens, refracts, strikes the back surface, refracts again, arrives at the second lens, which happens to be diverging, refracts, and refracts at surface 4. Then it passes through air to the third lens, and at surface 5, refracts again, and at surface 6, it refracts one final time, and passes out of the lens system towards the optic axis. Because the ray came in parallel, it will strike the optic axis at the paraxial focus of the system. A second ray also leaves the object, arrives at the vertex of the front surface. So the best name for this is chief ray, refracts at each surface and continues to refract until finally it comes out of surface six and proceeds outward until it collides with the marginal or the parallel ray. Where those rays intersect, you have the image. If this object is at infinity, the image will form at the praxial focus and will have zero height. I'll show you my analysis of this setup using the spreadsheet where I'll just calculate a few praxial quantities. Every surface gets a column in the spreadsheet. Column C is the object. Column D is surface 1. Column E is surface 2. Column F is surface 3 and so forth. I'm going to open up the actual spreadsheet now and show you the formulas that go into these cells. So in column C where you have the object, the first number we encounter is t, the thickness. So that is the distance after the object until the next surface. 200 millimeters was described in our figure. And the index of refraction in the object space is 1, it's air. The marginal ray, which in this example is a parallel ray, starts at a height of 3. In other words, I'm arbitrarily putting the object at a height of 3 millimeters above the optic axis. It turns out no matter what I set that to, it doesn't change the paraxial quantities we will calculate. The angle at which this marginal ray leaves the object is 0 degrees or 0 radians. A second ray leaves the object at the same place, 3 millimeters above the optic axis, but it's going to strike the vertex of the front surface. The angle that the chief ray leaves the object can be calculated from a, just a simple triangle. Light leaves at a distance of 3 millimeters above the optic axis. And it travels a distance 200 millimeters to the first lens surface. The angle is the angle relative to the horizontal. It's the arc tangent of 3 over 200, but it's a small number, so it's just 3 over 200 in radians. That's where that U prime comes from. These angles, U, which are in radians, have the prime on them to indicate that I'm always talking about the angle after the surface of interest in that column. So now we fill in the radii of curvature. These come from an optimization that I did on a Cook triplet. And the curvature is 1 divided by the radius of curvature in units of per millimeter. The thickness is after the surface. So after surface 1, there's 5 millimeters, meaning lens 1 is 5 millimeters thick, lens 2 is 4 millimeters thick, lens 3 is 3 millimeters thick. The distance between lens 1 and 2 is 7.957. That's pretty precise. And for between lens 2 and 3, it's 4.876 millimeters. The 104 millimeters after lens 3 will need to be calculated, and I'll go over that. Refractive indices are just typed in. Always 1 in the air, so after surface 1, it's a refractive index of crown glass. After surface 2, it's air. After surface 3, it's the refractive index of flint glass, which tends to be a little bit higher. And the surface powers can be calculated. The difference in refractive indices times the curvature. And notice, for every column, there's a pattern here. It repeats. So if you need to add a fourth lens, you simply copy these cells and paste them there and change the names of the column headers and you are all set with a fourth lens. 
But if you do add more lenses, what happens down here in the image calculation will change. Now the marginal ray and chief ray calculations begin with the marginal ray at the object and the chief ray at the object, both being emitted three millimeters above the surface. And the chief ray, of course, goes to that angle. And when they arrive at surface one, the marginal ray is still at a height of three millimeters because it came out with an angle of zero. Even though I have an equation in here, but since C9 is zero, the angle is zero, it's three millimeters maintains. But after refraction, we have a new angle. And the equation in cell D9 is paraxial ray trace equation number one. Just like the equation in cell D8 was paraxial ray tracing equation number two. The paraxial ray tracing equation number two is just the equation of a straight line connecting the surface with the next surface. Paraxial ray tracing equation number one is Snell's law using the angle relative to the horizontal instead of the angle relative to the normal. The ray propagates through lens one and arrives at surface two at a lower height, calculated by paraxial ray tracing equation two, and emerges at a new refraction angle, calculated from paraxial ray tracing equation one, and then it propagates to surface three, just following the straight line equation, where it refracts and emerges with a new angle, 00696, so on. And it goes through lens two to the back surface, and now it's at a height of 2.29 millimeters, and it emerges with an angle of plus 0.057 radians. And it propagates to lens three, and so on and so forth. The chief ray does the same thing. It arrives at surface one at the vertex, so at zero. Practical ray trace equation number two is in this cell. The angle U prime that we calculated ensures that that's going to be zero. And paraxial ray trace equation number one gives us the angle of refraction after the ray passes through surface one. And then when the ray arrives at surface two, it has a height of minus 0.047 millimeters and a new angle. It goes through air and arrives at surface three and has a new angle. It goes through lens two to surface four and refracts with a new angle. Goes through air to surface five and refracts with a new angle. Goes through lens three to surface six and emerges with a new angle. These two angles in cells I9 and I11 are important because now we have angles that we can use to locate where the image forms. That's what's happening in the bottom box here. We'll find an image at 104.839 millimeters and we'll be able to get the effective focal length too. Let's talk about doing this. The first thing we really want to do is find out where these two rays meet out here because that will be where the image is. So the marginal ray passes through the focal point in the back and the chief ray meets it at the image. Where they meet, the height of the chief ray and the height of the marginal ray are equal. And I'll use y sub c and y sub m to denote those. Let's write this equation of a line. You know the height of these two rays at surface six. So y sub c six is height of chief ray at surface six and y sub m six for the marginal ray. They proceed at their respective angles that were calculated in cells I9 and I11. And they go a distance x, which we don't know. And they arrive at a height of the image. Set them equal and solve for x and you find that the image forms at this place, that is the equation then that you put into cell B14. The marginal ray height and the chief ray height have to be equal and they're calculated at that value position using what we just got in cell B14. Minus 1.579 millimeters is the image height. With that, you can calculate the magnification. Minus 1.579 millimeters divided by three millimeters, the original object height, is minus 0.526, the paraxial magnification. A more abstract quantity is the effective focal length. The operand in Zmax is EFFL. The way to find it is to take that incoming parallel ray, extrapolate a virtual parallel ray all the way through the system, and look at that outcoming marginal ray, and extrapolate a virtual marginal ray back into the glass. If you are sitting down here looking at that marginal ray, as far as you know, it's coming from out here someplace. Where these two extrapolated rays meet is called the back principal plane, usually denoted as P prime. And the effective focal length is measured relative to the back principal plane. 
focal point is where the marginal ray strikes the optic axis and the distance from the back principal plane to the focal point is the effective focal length. So we're just one triangle away from knowing what it is. So cell C8 divided by the tangent of cell I9, remembering that I9 is in radians, gives you the effective focal length. Tangent is pretty optional because we're in the small angle approximation. Can you see why the minus sign is there? This angle, U prime sub M6, is a negative number because a counterclockwise rotation is needed to bring this marginal ray up to the parallel. So the effective focal length is to the right of the principal plane and needs to be positive. But when you calculate tangent of I9, we'll have a negative number. So there is a minus sign in that equation. If by chance you are analyzing a lens configuration that's diverging, and this last ray goes out away from the optic axis, you should expect to see a negative effect of focal length. And you will if you keep that minus sign in the equation. So we calculate several paraxial quantities. We have the effect of focal length, the magnification. We know where the image forms for an object that's 200 millimeters in front of the lens. And if the object's at infinity, the image will form at the paraxial focus. Let's compare what we got to ray trace software I open up ZMAX and put in the, the same triplet. In fact, I optimized it in ZMAX. I have lens 1, lens 2, and lens 3, and these are the same distances that we worked with and the same radii of curvature. And I just used the measuring tool in the layout and measured a distance from the back vertex to where the image forms of 104.6 millimeters. Compare that to 104.83 millimeters. Now, this was a rough measurement, right? Because I'm just using a measuring tool. So where I click is where I click. You can get that number more precisely by looking in the surface data report. And surface 7 is the back surface of the lens in this run, but because I put a surface 1 right here at the edge of the screen just so I can see some rays coming into the first lens. Back surface of the third lens has a thickness of 104.791 millimeters, meaning it's 104.791 millimeters from the back surface of the lens to where the image formed. Pretty close to 104.839. That 48 micron difference could be due to a lot of things. It's probably due to rounding errors in the refractive indices, where ZMAX uses refractive indices with a lot of significant figures, and I didn't. If you open up the system data report, you can see the effective focal length and the praxial magnification. So remember, the effective focal length is the distance from the back principal plane to the praxial focus, the place where an object at infinity forms an image. Zmax calculates 74.998, which you can compare to our 74.979 millimeters. Again, the discrepancy probably due to the refractive indices. And the praxial magnification, minus 0.526. So it's all pretty good. You can calculate these quantities effectively with a spreadsheet. You can't use a spreadsheet to do what Optic Studio does, at least not this spreadsheet. The optimization is a much more sophisticated process. There's no comparison. The purpose for me of making these spreadsheets is so that I can develop an intuitive understanding of the quantities that you get from lens design software. Rather than just taking the numbers, it's good to understand what they mean, where they come from. And that's why I make the spreadsheet. And then you also have the spreadsheet so that when you don't have access to the lens design software, you can still calculate some pretty useful quantities. And one last thing, it might be tempting while we're at it to go ahead and calculate the Seidel aberration coefficients using the procedures I presented in my videos on aberrations. But I want to remind you that the technique I presented other videos to calculate aberration coefficients is appropriate for infinite conjugates only, and this is decidedly not an infinite conjugate system. In this example, the object was located 200 millimeters in front of the first lens, not at infinity. But nevertheless, let's give it a shot, at least for spherical aberration, as I've done here, because we can calculate the spherical aberration for infinite conjugates using the information in the spreadsheet. The Seidel coefficient can be calculated for each surface separately, and then add it up to give a total. And that is the spherical aberration that will be seen with this triplet combination if the object's at infinity. Check this out in Optic Studio. First, putting the object at infinity, 
We get an aberration coefficient, S1, for spherical aberration of 0.000225. Compare that to what was calculated in the Excel spreadsheet, 0.00022428. So you can calculate aberrations for the combination, just keeping in mind that it's not for the combination of lenses in the configuration of an object at 200 millimeters. Okay, that about summarizes our paraxial ray calculations of the Cook triplet. Thanks for watching.